What you don't need is trouble. Amen? Nobody wants trouble. I don't like hard. Do you like hard? Like difficult, challenging, frustrating, keep you up at night, sweat a lot, struggle, headache type lifestyle where eventually you can't tell what day of the week it is, whether you're coming or going. You don't know what exactly you're supposed to be doing and you're starting not to know where to go to get help. You're starting to forget that he promised you joy. You're like, well, I don't see a lot of that currently, or I'm having trouble with that. And, and I said this speaks to me and to my wife. I'm not describing our life in the sense of it is joyless. In fact, I find very recently that she and I will just randomly say to one another, I really like my life. And the other one will say, you know what, me too. But we've talked together about what does it mean when the Bible says I'm blessed? What is blessing according to God, not according to me? Because when it's according to God, it rarely has to do with money. But if I say blessing to any average person who doesn't know Jesus, they're going to think money. Because money makes life easy. That's what poor people are taught. We've talked about why you would want to be baptized. We've talked about why you need to make a choice. We've talked about knowing who my enemy is. And I feel very strongly now is a perfect season to make sure we know a lot of really basic in the sense of this ain't complicated. I'm not trying to figure out. So you may have heard of a man's name before, John Calvin. He's one of the early church fathers of the Protestant Reformation. His counterpart is Martin Luther. Well, John Calvin and Martin Luther both trained as lawyers before they were pastors, ministers, priests. John Calvin was hyper-intelligent. He wrote a volume of texts called The Institutes of Religion. And in there, he answered all sorts of questions that many people would say, well, it's too complicated for me. I'm glad he figured that out. And I could follow along with John Calvin pretty far until he started trying to put to words what God must have been doing before he created anything. In other words, what was God doing before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Well, who can know that? I only, my Bible starts with Genesis 1, 1. I don't know what was happening in Genesis 0 because God didn't tell me. And by the way, everything you know about God... He told you. You didn't figure him out any more than you figure yourself out. And if you've lived long enough, you realize that's the truth. You ain't got you figured out yet. Every time you think you've got something under control, something comes along and you realize, oh, I didn't, I didn't have under control. What I thought I had under control. And the new thing God's been working on in my own heart is, hey, Mason, you need to figure out that you don't have time because you don't have what you don't have. See, I can't grasp time. I can't stop it. I can't speed it up. I can't store it. I can only make use of, of, of what he's given but it's not mine, so I don't have time. So people say, do you have time for that? The answer is no, but I can use the time that I am given to, to do what you're asking. Well, something else that I think is fairly basic biblically, but super hard in application, is to be able to answer our question, what are we supposed to do when things are hard? What do we do when it gets hard? A lot of people say you quit, you give up, you go home, you stop. I don't play sports. I don't even come remotely close to playing sports on any important level, but my daughter does play volleyball. And you ever noticed how easy it is to judge people's skills from the sidelines? I mean, they're the ones out there running, grunting, sweating, falling, and you're like, come on, you could have got that. I'm, uh, what do you know? What do I know? You know, but it just comes out of your mouth. You don't, you don't really know. And it's the same way when we see people struggling in life. We feel like, you know, really what we could do is say the phrase that's always dangerous to start with. You know what you should do. You know, somebody comes up to you, they don't know. You know what you should do. I remember being very young, and this is a story I've told uh, at least years ago, when my father lost his job. And he didn't lose his job for anything because of his fault. He lost it because the company was sold into parts. And so here he was, an older man. You were probably my age. Were you 45, 46, 47, somewhere around there? Here's a 45, 46-year-old man had the same job for, I don't know, 25 years, working at the same place or longer. Now it's gone. And so he has to go out into the world of truck drivers and get a new job. And I remember him sharing with my mother, I was overhearing his frustration, that every time he talked about how hard it was for him to get a job, how much trouble he was having getting a job, somebody with a job would say, Oh, don't worry, the right job for you is out there. Or, oh, don't worry, it's, it's coming. Well, you know what that didn't do for my father? 
pay bills. And everybody that was saying that to him, I remember saying, they all have a job, so they don't know. Just like when we have troubles of any kind and somebody wants to offer help, maybe, but they don't stop to listen to us first. They want to offer me advice without hearing. Well, then I don't want to hear what they advise. God is willing to listen, by the way. God is very willing to listen. But in the listening, he also will explain to you what to do when things have gotten hard. And I would like to look at a place in the Bible that I go to. There are, there are three places I go to more regularly, I find, in my personal life than anywhere else. The first, the most common, the most often is Romans chapter 12. I go there all the time. Because in Romans chapter 12, there is a list of this is what your life is supposed to look like. And from that list is my favorite verse in the entire Bible where it tells me that it's my job to be at peace with everyone if I'm the one choosing. So if you and I are together and I choose peace or war, then there's going to be peace. But understood is that I won't always be the one choosing. So Paul says, in so much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Another place I go quite often is kind of related to this in that it's really close to 19. It's chapter 20 of the book of Jeremiah. It's where Jeremiah is beaten by a priest. And then he begins to challenge God and he says, you lied to me. You told me I was called to be a prophet and you would give me words to say, but you didn't tell me that everything I had to say was bad and would make people angry with me. Because see, Jeremiah was the prophet who God called to tell all of Israel, it's too late. No more chances. Don't you like it when your mama would say, if you do that one more time, and you knew you had about eight times to go? Because she wasn't, she wasn't red in the face yet. So, oh man, I got more than one time. Well, see, God had even done that with the Israelites. You don't, you don't stop. It's, yeah, you bet, hey, I'm telling you one more. But then God said, no more times. And the way that he used the person he used to say those words is Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah said, you know, when I was a young man, you called me to be a prophet, and I thought it was going to be easy, but you lied to me. Well, that's Jeremiah 20, and I, I find myself studying there often to see not, not so much Jeremiah complaining, but that even in his difficulty, the words he can't get away from, that God is still exactly who he's always been. But then another place I go to is 1 Kings 19. Another prophet, this man's name is Elijah. And Elijah is probably most well-known. He has a lot of really neat things happen in his life. But one that he might be most well-known for by a lot of people is when he goes alone against a lot of false prophets. And he goes up on a mountain with those false prophets because it's time to cut sides. There's been a drought for three years. Ahab hates. Ahab is the king of Israel. And he hates Elijah's guts because he thinks it's Elijah's fault for the drought, because Elijah said it won't rain for three years until God says so. Well, it's Elijah that said that, according to Ahab. Ahab doesn't have the faith to realize that what Elijah said first was, thus says the Lord, it will not rain. Okay, so he's blaming Elijah. He hates Elijah's guts. He wants Elijah dead. And Elijah has a face-off with the, all of these prophets of Baal, this false deity that the Israelites have been worshiping because Ahab has encouraged them to do so. So they go up on Mount Carmel, which is in the northwest area of the coastal region of Israel. And, and he says, okay, let's, let's do it like this. We're going to set up an altar. And you guys are going to pray to Baal. Do whatever you got to do. And if Baal sets that altar on fire, then I'll leave. And Israel's in the right for worshiping Baal. But if he doesn't, I'm going to get Yahweh to do it. And if Yahweh does it, y'all are doomed because they're going to get killed. Well, so they set up the altar, and they're up there's hundreds of them. And, and Elijah, he knows what I hope most of you know. There is only one God, and his name is Yahweh. There is no Baal to worship. There is no equal deity that you could choose from. There is no buffet of a pantheon of options in heaven. There is one God. Elijah knows this. Those prophets don't. And so they get around that altar and they get to hollering and they get to dancing and they get to shouting and Elijah starts picking at them. This is one of the reasons I go to this spot. I like people in the Bible who have attitude 
And so Elijah has a little sly attitude. And he's like, oh, no, fellas, he must be busy up there. Y'all got to shout louder. So he, they start shouting. They start cutting themselves, sacrificing their own blood to get Baal to add. And he's like, uh-oh, guys, maybe he's asleep. You got to keep. So he's just working them up, working them up. Nothing happens. No fire. No nothing. So Elijah says, okay, my turn. But it's not just enough to get that altar to set fire, see? I, I'm telling you, I like people with attitude in the Bible. I, I love them because they're normal. We think people all walked around Bible times sometimes like, peace be upon you. And then, they, you know, they didn't do that. They were regular people going to the grocery store, eating dinner, complaining about their wife's cooking, whatever. But Elijah says, hey, wait, wait. Before I get started, pour water on that wood. So they go get water. They pour it on the wood. He says, wait, wait more. And so they even have to dri dig a little moat, like a little trench in the ground around the altar of stone and wood so that water is pouring off of the altar and catching in that little moat they've dug. So there's like a trench around the altar. It's soaked with water, filled with water. And all of the wood and the stone, it's soaked with water because Elijah is going to make sure nobody says it was an accident. So, oh, it was real dry that day and a spark. No, no, no. It's soaked. It is literally sitting in water. And there is a beautiful prayer to know in, in this passage of 1 Kings. But really, if we summarize it, all Elijah does is he says, okay, let me pray, fellas, one second. God, prove it. That's basically all he says. That's a lot more words, but that's the gist. Do what you do. And the Bible says fire literally just falls straight out of heaven. And it doesn't just burn the wood. It doesn't just consume that wood, it consumes the rocks, it consumes the water, it burns the ground. Everybody watching that says, uh-uh, I think we better worship Yahweh. Shortly after that, Elijah looks at those prophets. I mean, what would you do if you were one of them, by the way? And he looks at all those Israelites who are realizing they've been led astray, that they've been led to worship a false god, and he says... Get them. No prophet leaves that mountain. Oh, now Ahab is really burnt up. And his queen, Jezebel, sends word to Elijah the prophet and says, You will be exactly like those prophets by the sunset if my name is not Jezebel, queen. In other words, she puts a bounty on his head. You're going to die. You killed them and you made me look bad. Now you're dead. Now Elijah just had the power in his own relationship with God to pray what is, guarantee you, no lie, a Brother Mason translation of, hey, God, do it. But that's literally almost what he says. He just saw that happen. He just saw God consume all of this trouble right in front of his face. But as soon as he hear that Jezebel has put a hit on him, he gone. He runs in fear. And he runs from Mount Carmel to the wilderness. That's not me running from here to Sally's. That's not me running from here to Walmart. He runs 90 miles. Now you tell me how scared a man is if he's willing to run 90 miles. That's, for, that's basically from here to Jackson. He's gone because he is terrified. But in his terror, he also believes one thing, that he had failed. See, he's gotten hard for Elijah, but he's wrong. He thinks he failed because it didn't change the situation. See, he did everything he was supposed to do. He set up that altar. He got involved with those prophets. And when he spoke the words, God responded with action. He did everything that God had told him. So why now are they coming to kill me? And Elijah believes a lie. I must be the only one left. I must be the only man of faith left in Israel. So he runs off into the wilderness. He runs off into Nowhereville. He ends up at Mount Horeb, the Mount of God, often called Mount Sinai as well. So he ends up in the same place God delivered the Ten Commandments. He has an encounter with an angel. He's fed by God. And then he goes to the top of that mountain where Moses would have gone to hear God speak because he's looking for the same thing, except he doesn't want to hear from God. He wants to tell God, I failed. No one believes but me, so kill me because I don't want to be here anymore. Just like the fathers before me, talking about the prophets that had preceded him, the people, the leaders that had preceded him, all the way into judges, and ju just like they did to them, they've turned their back on me and the truth, so just let me come home, I'm done with this. 
And the angel sends him further up the mountain. So now he's where, where Moses would have been almost. And we have verses 11 through 13 of Elijah seeking God because it's hard. And so we ask, well, then what do I do when it's hard? Well, let's look at what happens with Elijah and what he hears God tell him. Verse 11 begins like this. This is an angel of the Lord, by the way, when it says, so he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Bible says, the Lord was passing by. And a great and powerful wind was tearing out of the mountains and breaking the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. Old King James says, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard that, this still blowing, this gentle noise, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah is in a place of difficulty in his life. He has run from his calling, and he's looking for God. Because when it's hard, we sometimes get this feeling that he's gone. And so he's gone looking for him in the place that he's supposed to have started. Moses got the Ten Commandments. The people stood around that mountain for a long time, seeing thunder and lightning at its peak. This must be where I'll find you. Also, I'm terrified to stay home. And he has this encounter But that encounter is teaching us something that we're going to miss because we're not good little Jewish boys and girls. See, we might not be familiar with why it's those things. Why is there a huge wind that literally is so powerful it breaks rocks apart? Why does it mention that? Why does it mention an earthquaking event? Why does it mention fire? Why those things? And then does the Bible specifically record for me and God wasn't in them? Well, let's talk about that. Let's learn what the Bible is telling me about seeing God where he is. Now, why? Why does it say a, literally a great strong wind in verse 11? Why does it say that? Because the Hebrews had been taught their own history And God previously had appeared to them, worked in them with a great strong wind. In Exodus 14 and verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. This is when the Red Sea parts. And listen, the Lord swept the sea back with a great eastern wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so that the waters were divided. So God came as a great strong wind and blew the water in half. So God is, they knew, in the wind. Also, if we go to the book of Job, which by date, oldest book in the the Old Testament, not by event, obviously Genesis is oldest by event, it's at the very beginning, but in age of who wrote it when, Job is the oldest book. And when Job is asking God, come before me, let me put you on trial, because I think you made a mistake in my situation, I get to verse 1 of chapter 38 of Job, and it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. What's a whirlwind? A lot of wind, a strong wind. Elijah would think to find God in the strong wind because his whole history was familiar with God being in the wind. But he wasn't there. The Bible says, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. Okay, but it says it was an earthquake after that. Does Elijah have a reason to think that God's presence would be accompanied by an earthquake? Well, on the mountain he's standing, he would have known the Old Testament's testimony that when Moses was there talking to God, the whole mountain shook in the presence of the Israelites as God spoke to the point that his presence on the mountain made them so scared they wouldn't even touch it. They built a fence around the mountain where they stood. Now, literally not. See, when you're a kid and you're taught that, like me, I remember being taught that at some point. I don't even know where I was. They're like, and the Israelites built a fence around the mountain. My only thought as a child was, that is a long fence. 
I mean, brrr, all the way around, no, 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 just in between where they were, you know. It was like, a, like those things that you line up that, that direct your line when you're at the airport, you know, those little barricades. It's like that. But it's literally, don't touch that, you'll die. So they just put a little barrier there, a, a fence between them and the mountain. This is what the Bible says in chapter 19, verse 18 of Exodus. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in the fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. God's presence. They knew he was there because the mountain would start to rumble. And they knew God was on the mountain because the earthquake was the sign of his presence. And yet the earthquake on the same mountain. Elijah isn't some random place. He is on the same mountain. So it stands to reason God's in the earthquake. The earthquake means God's here, and it says what? God was not in the earthquake. Well, then it brings up what? Verse 12 says, a fire. That there came a fire. Do you know about God being in a fire? On the same mountain that he's standing on, perhaps. Obviously, we know it's hard to know which mountain was Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb in a long time ago when they weren't writing that stuff down. But antiquity says, tradition says, it's the same mountain that the bush was burning that God delivered the Ten Commandments. The same spot. Moses is in the middle of nowhere. But what does he see in Exodus chapter 3? It says that Moses sees out of the corner of his eye, must turn aside. What, what is that? He sees a burning bush. A bush on this mountain that will not be consumed. It's on fire, but it will not burn up. Moses said, this is chapter 3, by the way, sorry. I think I'm, I might be getting a little excited. Exodus 3, verses 3 and 4, Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, this amazing thing, why the bush is not being burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush. Well, what is the bush's condition? Burning. God is in that fire. And so the fire calls out and says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Then he goes on and says, God says, take them shoes off, man. You're standing where I am, and that's holy. And I don't want you bringing... You ever... Does God have a problem with shoes? You ever wonder? Like, see, you ever think about the things you never stop to think? Let that one rattle around in your head a minute. Do you ever think about the things you don't stop to think? Like, for example, why does God tell him to take his shoes off? Well, stupid preacher, because it's holy ground. Well, what do shoes and holy ground... I notice you're all wearing them now. But this is church, this is sanctuary, this is a holy place. Uh, excuse me? Well, but God was there with him. I'm sorry, where does God dwell? I mean, if I am a temple, as Paul says to the Corinthians, and thus he says to me, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, I'm supposed to never wear shoes. I am holy ground. You ever stop to wonder, why did God tell him to take his shoes off? Remove your sandals from your feet. The ground you stand on is holy. I don't have a good answer for you except one I like to ponder. Shoes carry on them the dirt of the world. And God was saying, don't bring the world's trash here with me. I'm separate from that. That's why you hear me say multiple times, if I don't know how it works for you, but when I pray before a service and I say, take everything that's in our brains Take every schedule, every calendar, everything that's pulling at me, take it from me right now. Because those are my shoes, and I'm on holy ground. That stuff doesn't belong here. That doesn't have anything to do with this necessarily, but I just... Elijah knows those things. He's thinking those things. God was in the fire of the bush. But that's not the only time when God is leading the Hebrew in the Exodus. They've left Egypt, and now they're going to the promised land that Abraham had been promised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before. They're finally the ones going. And Exodus 13, 21 says, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead the way, in a pillar of fire by night. God's connection with fire was the presence of God with his people. This even goes into the New Testament at the day of Pentecost, what falls on the, on the apostles? Tongues of fire. God is in fire. He is represented to us somehow by fire. Yet Elijah's experience, it says that there was a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. 
The three places that he had been taught over and over and over, that's where you'll find God. That's where you'll experience God. In the great wind, in the earthquake, in the fire, and there on the mountain of God. That's literally what Horeb means, mountain of God. So Mount Horeb, that's God's mountain. He's not in those things. But then it says something else. In fact, it says something that doesn't translate into English one-to-one super easy. At the end of verse 12, still small voice, gentle breeze, still wind, quiet wind, you hear about this gentle blowing. And that is when Elijah knows God has come. Because it says, then he covers his face and he walks outside. He didn't walk outside during the earthquake. He didn't walk outside during the great wind. That's where God was. That's where he would want to be. But he knows he's not there. But then there's something different. Now, the literal translation for this word, the best I can give you in English, is you can choose small silence. That's one way to translate it, small silence. The other way to translate it literally would be thin stillness. Either way you like, small silence or thin stillness, I want you to recognize that both the word small and thin describe things that are easy to miss. Something that's easy to not see if I'm focused on an earthquake. You see, if I'm focused on the ground shaking or the great wind blowing rocks in two, I'm going to miss a thin stillness. This is something easily breakable. The image being that it's, think about silence for a second and the fact that you've never heard it. Because you can't turn this off. But even though I've said, let's be, let's see, can we be silent in this room together for a moment? You heard something. And it, it, so what, you know, oh, it's a, it's a child making a noise. It's the air conditioner. Is somebody opening one of them peppermints, you know, <laughs> all that noise. Okay, but let's try again. We'll try again. You even try on purpose. I'm going to warn you it's coming. We're going to try to be quiet, silent, ready, go. Thanks a lot, Rody. <laughs> See? You can't have it. Except the Bible says that's where God is. God is in, I should have waited for that to happen. <laughs> okay, but I want to ask you a question. How much noise is in your daily life? How loud is your every day? Because the Bible says you will find him in this small fragileness. But I want you to think about how loud your life is. How loud is all the time? Somebody needs something. Somebody wants something. Your knee hurts. The car needs money put into it. You're worried about your job. Ain't nobody in here being paid enough. I'm hungry. Somebody made me mad. My neighbor won't cut their strip of grass. That kid won't stop making noise. Somebody will open in one of them peppermints. I mean, whatever it is, your life is defined by noise. And you see this reflected in your understanding of God and your relationship Because if you're honest, I think you'll find you're normally looking for him in some great big thing. In other words, God, send me a sign. When I was a kid, before I knew what love really was, I was was madly infatuated with a little red-headed girl who lived up the hill. So God, am I going to marry her? I mean, why do eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds ask these questions? I guess because we want to be grown. I don't know. If, if I'm going to marry her, turn my fan off. You know, and you're laying in bed. Is it slowing down? No, because God doesn't do that. He doesn't send you letters in the mail either. Do you know why? Because you already have the full testimony of everything he needs you to know right there. But you don't know what he sounds like because you don't know what that says. So that's why the lesson is so interesting to me from Elijah's point of view. Everything about that moment makes total sense to him. 
Yeah, God would be in an earthquake. Yeah, he'd be in a great big wind. Yeah, he'd be in a fire. I know all those places that he's appeared in those things, and yet now I can tell he's not in them. And so when he shows up, God, Elijah gets that there's something special, unique about this moment for me. I need to go out now. But we don't know that because we don't know that. Our life is too loud. We're rapidly, somebody, somebody said uh, 2023 was in the slow lane until September 1st, and now it's going 85 and a 30. Right? It's, we got to the end of, it's the end of September right now. Like the end of this coming, this week that we're in, Friday is it, September, now it's October, now it's holiday season. And we're all going to be in, in a rush to get to our favorite part of the holiday season. But then the holiday season for us, I hope, many of us, if not all in this room, includes the most, well, I may might argue, one of the most profound moments in our religious understanding. And we'll be so busy putting out decorations and buying gifts of things that people will forget what they got a year from now. And we'll be so busy telling tales about things that aren't important or don't matter or planning for events that aren't as serious as we sometimes think they are and miss why we're doing it in the first place. Because it's all loud. It's all noisy. If you don't believe me, stand around a grandma who's getting ready for 30 people to come to her house and tell me how spiritual she's feeling. Not is the answer. How loud is your life? Because the lesson of Elijah is trying to teach us, you get help when it's hard, when you know where he is. And when it's hard, it's when you're being called the most to be silent. You may know a woman of Mother Teresa. She shouldn't be called that anymore. By Catholic understanding, she's St. Teresa of Calcutta. She was canonized after her death. But Mother Teresa, you know, a little lady, white, white hood with little blue stripes on it. I want you to look with me at what she says about this issue of silence. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. Well, just stop there for a minute. Don't even worry about it. See, it's even loud when you're trying to finish reading a quote because your brain is too busy trying to read it all. i got to read it, then I can listen. Well, just stop on that very, in the silence of the heart, God speaks. So how quiet is your heart? Every worry you got lives right there. Every concern of yours, same spot. This isn't some underhanded sly advertisement for the podcast that I record on Wednesdays, but just this past week, the episode was about trusting your heart. See, we misunderstand the heart the way the Bible teaches. The word leb, heart, means self. It means who you are. See, if I asked you point to where your thoughts come from, every American citizen will say this. But to a Hebrew, if I said, now this is a biblical Hebrew, where do your thoughts come from? Here. This is me. This is the seat of the soul, they called it. This is why Jesus says out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth will speak, not the overflow of your mind, because they see that all in your heart. How loud is it in your heart? Because here, and you're not Catholic and neither am I, but I can respect wisdom when I see it. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. See, in the stillness, in that sensitive, easy-to-break thing. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. And look into her opinion what he has to tell you. You are nothing. Then you will know that you are nothing. It is only when you realize your nothingness, your emptiness, that God can fill you with himself. Souls of prayer are souls of great silence. Now, I can't stress this question enough. How loud is your life? Because it is so loud that all of us in here know we can't really hear that because it's too noisy in my hearing place. If I just stopped and be quiet, well then who's cooking dinner? Who's cleaning the stalls? Who's going to work? You ever thought about why it's so strange that God says every seventh year you're gonna let that ground lie? Who in an agricultural environment is like, yeah, it's a good idea every seventh year to just not plant stuff and see how it happens? Because every seventh year, God had set into their society, that's a year for you to remember how much you trust me. Because you do nothing, and I take care of it. 
Well, when's the last time you did nothing in something because you trust God so much? In fact, I would offer to you that regularly it's only out of desperation we do that because we got nothing left to try to do ourselves. But what if I recognize that the Bible was trying to teach me to flip that around? Do nothing first. And then with your heart of silence, you hear God say, here's exactly what I want. It's important that I finish that little experience with Elijah because when he goes out to that silent moment where God is, God doesn't say, would you get out of here? Take that simple, small problem you got and get out of my face. I'm too busy for that. He simply says, why are you here? He listens to you. See, when you're quiet, God hears everything you're saying. And then you're in the position to hear him respond. Most often when we pray, when we speak, when we share with God, it's all about telling him what we want or need. It is rarely about being still and saying, tell me what? Tell me how? Tell me where? Tell me why? That's not our prayer life regularly. Our prayer life is going to the Jesus ATM. I need this, 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 and this, and if you could get it done within a week, I'd really appreciate it. Now, there's nothing wrong, by the way. There's nothing wrong at all with telling God what you want. But if that's all you do, you don't have a relationship. You have a request line. He wants to speak to you. But that can't happen without our silence. And that's where our help is. And there's only one other point. When it's hard, i got to go to where he is. And where he is is in silence, not in all the noise. When it gets really hard, we try to fill silence because silence means I have to deal with what's hard. But God says, be still with me. And then tell me what's the matter. Now listen to me answer you. In his answer, which comes after that moment where he says, why are you here, Elijah? Elijah repeats himself for the third time. I blew it. Nobody believes but me. Everybody's a, a, a bum, so just kill me and let me come home. And God says, boy, get up off the ground and put your pants on and let's go to work. Because Elijah is wrong. Because a lot of times, sometimes, every once in a while, our trouble is from a misunderstanding. We're wrong about something. We think we're right, but we're wrong. Sometimes it's also hard because we want to avoid a part that's embarrassing. My life is hard. I'm using this as an example. My life is hard because I struggle with alcohol. But I don't want to be still and talk to God about that because I don't want to have to tell people I'm struggling with alcohol. Which, by the way, is why if you ever attend an AA meeting or know somebody who does, that's why they have to introduce themselves and say, hello, my name is Mason and, I'm a, and I am an alcoholic. Because they're confessing their fault. They're getting over that embarrassed part because that embarrassed part is keeping you from healing. So as I got a problem with theft, I got a problem with being obedient, I got a problem with listening to my spouse, I got a problem with being kind, I got a problem with showing grace, I got a problem with forgiving. Whatever that is, you start the healing process in stillness by saying, hey God, this is where I am. Which is, uh, God says that to Elijah, hey, why are you here? Or in other words, where are you, man? So God invites that conversation by what's wrong? Where are you? Why are you here? Well, I have this problem. Okay, God's going to give you the solution to that. I guarantee you it might not be easy, it might not be fast, and it might not come quick. But he's going to tell you what to do. The truth of it is, though, you can't skip the hard part. That hard part is recognizing what's wrong. So when I get to the hard part, i got to be able to say, this is what's hard. This is what's hurting. This is what's wrong. And a lot of times... I also have to say, this is what I did. I did that. And I made that mess, and it's really hard to look at, and I don't want to talk about it, and I was hoping somebody would clean it up and take it away. But you can't skip the hard part. And I want to tell you why. And I want you to listen. It's the whole reason I'm standing up here. I don't normally put a whole bunch of long words on the wall, so I'm putting them up here because I'm hoping they'll stick. Somebody needs the part of the story that you're ashamed of. Somebody in your life needs to know that you have a problem because they do too. And they need your healing in it 
so they can be shown that they don't have to stay in their problem. Paul says that it's by some of our own scars that we heal others who are wounded. Now, this isn't where we tell people, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. Oh, I know exactly how you feel, because you can't. And I know that's just speech, and that's how we talk, but it's not true. I don't know exactly what you're going through, and I don't know exactly how you feel. But what I can tell you, perhaps, is I know how I felt when this, this, this happened to me. And so let me tell you how God helped me. Or look at this person who walks with their head upright and their back straight and they don't seem beat down by life. They must have it all together. But then you get to know that person. They're like, you know, when God found me, it was a needle in my arm and I had betrayed every person in my family and I was living all by myself in the dirt, in the mud. And someone came to stick their hand out and say, I can take you somewhere other than this. And I took that hand and I followed them. And long story short, Jesus Christ, boom, now you see me. Oh, I'd have never thought that. You know, just by judging you, you got a good life and a nice house and a successful career and a healthy family. I'd have never known that. I know. And so it's tempting. If you'd never know that, it's tempting that if it's time to tell you my story to be like, I'm going to skip that part. I'm going to skip right over that ugly part so that you think I've had it together my whole life. But you can't skip the hard part. What's the hard part for Elijah. Well, I don't know about you, but running 90 miles would be part one. And then thinking that you had it all together and that you knew exactly what was up, that you were the only one of faith, only man of faith in Israel anymore, and that God was just going to let you loose of your job and to hear God say, you're wrong, boy. I got folks waiting on you right now, but they ain't got you because you're up here with me hiding on a mountain. Now, when Elijah went back to those people of faith, like, hey, man, where have you been? Uh, asking God to kill me, probably not the first thing he wants to tell them. But it was the truth. And it was the hard part. Because when I look at the prophet and I think, oh, he always knows the answers and he always knows the way to go and he's always speaking the words of the Lord. I never think that he lays his head down and says, I don't know what to do next. Just like every person in a church, this is, every person in a church has looked at the man standing behind whatever version of a pulpit he has and thought, that guy never does anything wrong. And then they expect him not to. I'm not lying to you when I tell you I had a, a, a woman tell me to my face, well, you're supposed to live better than the rest of us because you're the preacher. No. We're supposed to be equals and are equals in the eye of the Lord. So I got hard parts and there are certainly areas in my life that I'm ashamed of. Guarantee you. But if you need to know them, I'm going to tell them because they all put me here. Just like they're all by God being willingly used to take you somewhere you don't know. And by the way, you don't want to skip the hard part because you can't lose. In God you can't lose. In Isaiah 43, verse 2, very well known, though you pass through waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through fire, another fire mentioned, you will not be scorched and the flame will not touch you. God is saying no matter what you go through, it can't overtake you. It can't have you because you belong to me. So it'll call your name, it'll pull you down, it'll mark your body, it'll scar your soul, but it can't have what belongs to me. You are mine. And so none of that can take you. And if you need to hear that somewhere else with more words, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, you find verse 31. Don't just read the parts you like. Don't just read the parts you've heard before. Read the whole point of Paul finishing chapter 8. Because when you start in verse 31, you hear something you might have heard before. What do we say about all this stuff? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Then why do you act like you've got so many threatening enemies? Why do you live so afraid in a world that seems to be arrayed against you if the Bible says, but if God is on my side, <laughs> no matter who they bring, you can array a whole force filled with, uh, filled with a, a Goliaths. I don't care. And you may crush this, but you can't crush this. You can't do anything to me. 
Yes. But the reason you can't is not because I say so. You can say things that hurt me. That's a lie we teach children. God, kids don't listen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a lie. Parents taught children to try to not deal with the fact that people say ugly things that hurt. And we're like, hey, get over it, get over it, get over it. Words leave scars no one sees. And I believe there are people in heaven. Uh, I'm borrowing this from Beth Moore in her book. Uh, what's she write? Uh, get out of that pit. Uh, it might be that book, maybe another. And I know for some people, her name is a bad word now. Who cares? Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's distracting. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. She wrote and said, though my soul is saved, when I get to heaven, it may have scars of things I survived. Well, I think in heaven there may be people having scars that you put there because of the things you said. But it still didn't get them, didn't take them, didn't have them, because the Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? And if he stopped there, it would be enough. But he keeps going. He says if he didn't spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, then how will he not also, with his son, freely give us everything? Who brings charges against God's elect, God's chosen, God's children? God is the one who justifies us, so who is it that can condemn us? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who at the right hand of God now also intercedes for us, so who can separate us from his love? I mean, he doesn't just give me that... That's enough. If God is for me, who can be? He doesn't stop there. He keeps going in every way that you might be like, yeah, but he says, but no. Sure, the world can condemn you, but God justified you. And if he didn't spare Jesus, in other words, that's a really beautiful way of saying you don't realize how much you matter because he didn't spare his son. He sent him so that he could get you. And if he did that for you, will he not also give you what he promised through that son? Every good and beautiful thing. No one can condemn you because you've been justified. Will tribulation take us from Jesus' love? Will trouble, will persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of the sword? Can those things remove me and him? Verse 37, but in all these things we have overwhelmingly conquered through him who loves us because I am convinced that neither not death nor life, angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come, powers, height, depth, any created thing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are the winner. So quit living like a loser. Now a loser is always trying to fit in with the crowd. You're supposed to stick out. You're supposed to glow. You're supposed to be proud of God's work in the world and in your life. You're supposed to have a story to tell. You're not supposed to skip all the bad parts because the bad parts make the redemption all the more beautiful. But we're ashamed of it. We're, we're scared of it. We hide from it. And so we give ourselves trouble from it. And it's just more noise in our heart. But if you'll find God where he is, you'll hear everything he has to say. That's what you do when it's hard. You slow down. You be still. You listen. Elijah ran. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't imitate that unless you like running. He climbed a mountain. You ain't got to do that. He ate food brought to him by birds. Probably not in the cards for us. And he was given examples of where to expect God to be. And he wasn't. And then the stillness came. Something that our trouble tells us to avoid. Oh, don't be quiet, then you'll hear all the ugly. Then you'll be reminded of everything you've done wrong. No, no, no. Be busy so you don't have to think about it. In the stillness, God knows that that's where you need to be, so that's where he is. So how loud is your life? Only you know. And God is asking for you to be quiet. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you again for the privilege we have to be in this place. And thank you for reminding me when it's busy and when it's distracting and when there's issues of my own and issues of others. And there's this thing and that thing and the other thing. And then there's all that stuff in the back that I didn't deal with at the time. I thought I'd get to it later, and here it comes like a train joining in with its friends and neighbors as I seem to lose balance in my life. 
I'm tempted to think that I'm the only one even trying. I'm tempted to think that I'm the only one who's being attacked. So I want to run to the mountain and be by myself and tell you that I'm over it. I'm done. Take me home. In all of the ways that all of us are like that, Jesus, I ask you to teach us and show us how to be still, to find you when we are silent, submitting all things to you, our hearts and our lives, and the day to day, patient in listening to you reveal your will for us inside of the silence. Help us to celebrate where you found us and where you've taken us. And help us to celebrate that story for the good of others who are on their own journey and need to be brought forward as well. Lord, you do good and mighty things. And we ask that you allow us to bear witness to them all, that we might sing your praises and tell the good news of the risen Lord Jesus and the redemption that you've made available for all people. But I know that starts when we are quiet. In the quiet, Lord, I believe is where we can hear the truth. So speak it over us, I ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.